Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I am Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly respond to another question that a viewer had raised about this dichotomy that quite a few scholars create about Marxism and using, let's say, Foucault or Derrida or anyone else. So most of the time this argument is proffered in terms of, oh, I do Marxism, but I'm not a post-structuralist scholar or I'm not a post-modernist. And what is meant by it is that somehow, as if Marxism is the only answer to world's problem, and as if there is no structuralist Marxism, and as if people cannot come and tackle political and social problems from any non-Marxist point of views. So I'll try to answer this question, not according to simply what my preference is, but in terms of how I myself mix and match and use different approaches to talking about literature, but also talking about issues in the world. And why do I find it a more enriching experience. So let's talk about it. So talking about Marxism, let's say, I mean, the first thing we need to keep in mind is which Marx are they using? Is it early Marx or later Marx, right? And then within that, what is it? Marx's discussion of capitalism, Marx's discussion of labor, Marx's discussion of the proletariat, right? or the general intellect, if you go through Grundrisse, right? All of those things were meant to answer certain questions about the human condition. And what is foregrounded is the material existence of people in the world, right? That is where Marx starts from. And those are absolutely revolutionary ideas because we can use them and build a politics around them, build a literary theory around them, which exists, which people have used and are still using. But within Marxism too, let's say if we go to Pakistan, there are Leninist Marxists, there are Trotskyites, right? But that's where the lineage kind of ends, right? There are other Marxisms too, right? There are structuralist Marxism, people like Althusser, who completely reconfigures our understanding of identity and our understanding of ideology, right? Then there are autonomous Marxists, people coming from Italy. They take from the lineage of Antonio Gramsci, right? People like Franco Berardi and others who think of Marxism and Marxist thought and try to rethink it in contemporary worlds, you know, post-Lacan, post Derrida, post Foucault, post Baudrillard, right? Who then explain a different kind of Marxism, a Marxism that doesn't realize, doesn't rely on a centralized hierarchy of a vanguard or a political party, right? And those Marxisms, if you look at them, you will realize that what Franco Berardi does in his, let's say in his book, The Soul at Work, an explanation of the world as it is and what it does to digital labor, what it does to our lives in the world, cannot be possible with pure Marxism. You have to know your Foucault. You have to know your Deleuze and Guattari, right? You have to know what Baudrillard has done. Right? So these people that some Marxists call postmodernist critics, I don't even know what postmodernist philosophy is, are the very people whose work is informing contemporary Marxism. Right? And, and that's why the thought that is coming from Italy is really rich because it deals with cybernetics. It deals with how desire flows work, right? How now there isn't just the proletariat, there is also a knowledge economy and hence a cognitariat. These are the people who work with their minds but are still workers, right? They rent out their minds. The distinction between 
the factory worker who rented his body and a tech worker who rents his brain and there is no time when he is not on call. Psychoanalysis then plays a role in it too, right? So Marxism is no longer simply reading of the real aspects of economy and role of ideology in it. It has to incorporate in it the knowledges that have developed and what we call the post-structuralist scholars, post-modernist scholars, are the ones who have developed these knowledges, right? So let's say if we take Leotard, right? His main assertion is that, that, that there is no place in the world for grand narratives, right? World has increasingly become a place in which petite narratives are operative. There is a counter to that also. Of course, post-1980s, we are seeing the rise of grand narratives, religious grand narratives, nationalistic grand narratives, right? But maybe there is no space for a global proletariat. But if we infuse the question of the proletariat with Deleuze and with autonomous Marxism, then we realize maybe we can have loose alliances, right? Our conception of power in Marxism, right, was the obliteration of the state. Now we realize that the state is not the only institution in different nodes of power. There are multinationals, there are rich conglomerates who control our lives. Now if we abolish the state, that's exactly what the multinationals are trying to do so that they can do what they want in the world. So the questions then become more complex. These questions, my opinion is, can also be better understood if we know our Marxism and our Marxist ways of looking at class and class conflict, but also if we know our Foucault, right? When we know our Foucault, what we learn is the, the significance of discourses. Right? That how a discourse doesn't come, emanate from one spot or one place, how it is diffused, right? How it is produced by knowledge and power, and how when you live within a discourse, you don't even know it, but it shapes your body and your consciousness. So here is a great example. Like someone asked this question on the internet, you know, if discourses determine what we do, where do the armies come from, right? Well, the armies are institutions built by the state, right? That's not the question because in their very materiality, we know that army institutions are funded and built by the state. But why does someone in the army follow the law, follow the rules, fall in line, takes pride in it, derides the civilians and the civilian government. That is not written in any army manual. That is the discourse of being in army. You cannot explain it through ideology. You can only explain it through an understanding of what is a martial discourse. Let's say if you are in Pakistan army, why is there a distrust of civilian governments? Why is there a distrust of civilians? Why do most officers think that they are better than others? They are better than journalists. They are certainly better than politicians, right? All of it happens not because each one of them is dreaming about their betterment or is in that ideology. It's because there is a discourse of exclusivity, disclose, discourse of their own superiority, their own better management based in facts, right, in comparative, but that this discourse then determines their own view of self and also their view of others. Now, within this discourse, you know, if you build into this that our job is to protect this country and sometimes we have to overthrow an elected government to do that, that also is a discourse. Yeah, the orders would come from the top, but the only way the top can function and the others follow their orders is if everyone, and now if we bring in Marx, if everyone's his interest is connected to them, but also if everyone has bought into and has become a point in that discourse of power, right? 
So that's how, in my opinion, we can combine a knowledge of Marxism and Marx with a knowledge of post-structural philosophy or continental philosophy and understand the world better. Now let's go to Derrida. A lot of people think Derrida is too obscure, right? But what exactly is Derrida doing in most of his work? What Derrida is doing is, basic assumption is, that most of the power structures in this world, right, are created through discourses, right? And discourses are dominant forms of knowledge. In order to undo their power, all you have to do is explode them from within, unravel them from within. And when a discourse cannot hold itself together, right, you have disrupted it and hence changed people's perception about it. Right? Think of it, gender binaries, role of men and women. If you can disrupt it from within and, and, and say that that binary structure of male and woman is completely arbitrary and could go either way, you have destroyed the hierarchy of gender, right? So, in my opinion, you know, it is easy to make this distinction and say, I'm a Marxist, I don't believe in anything else. But the most revolutionary Marxist thought is already coming from the kind of left which acknowledges that Marx doesn't have all the answers, that a centralized hierarchy is absolutely not necessary, that the Marxist movements need to involve both the cognitariate as well as the proletariat, and that alliances can be loose, can be lateral, right? And that since power no longer comes from top down in most of the cases, it's diffuse, it doesn't have one location, right? Then the challenge to it must also come from different nodes, different locations. In order to gain this understanding, you can't just get there through Marx. You have to read your Deleuze, you have to read your Foucault, you have to read your Derrida, maybe Lyotard and others. And then, if you have these knowledges, the kind of Marxism that you will employ or the kind of Marxist thought that you would employ would be contemporary, would be complex, and we will take into account the complexity of contemporary neoliberal capitalism. Let's go beyond that. Even if we are raging against capitalism, the contemporary capitalism, we cannot understand it simply by reading Capital Volume 1 because capitalism has reached a different stage and that different stage is neoliberal capital. Capital is no longer controlled by state. We are no longer in advanced capital. We are in a form of capitalism where corporations and multinationals sometimes have more power than nation states, right? So if we understand that, then instead of eliminating the state being our solution, our solution could be strengthening the state so that it can compete against the power of neoliberal capital, right? And if it does that, it then can protect its own workers within the national space. This is a completely different kind of Marxism. We will still be fighting for the rights of the workers, both the knowledge workers and the proletariat, but we can only develop meaningful ways of resistance against this new stage of capitalism if we go beyond classical Marxism, if we go beyond thinking just in terms of class and class struggle. Right? And we can only do that if we read people who have already used post-structuralist, post-modern philosophy to re-articulate Marxism. So these are some of my thoughts. I hope these are useful to you. As I said in the beginning, I have no one theory that I follow. I have no one philosopher that I follow. In that sense, I am kind of a pragmatist. I use what works. The only thing that guides me, guides my philosophical leanings or my praxis, is that my work be connected to the people. 
and people who are oppressed, people who are under threat by powerful institutions. That's what is kind of my North Star. What gets me there doesn't really matter. So that's all I have today. I hope this was useful to you. Let me know what you think. Uh, I'm pretty sure I have not done justice to the question, but at least I've been able to share my thoughts about it. Thank you so much. I hope you all are staying safe and taking care of each other. Please continue to do so, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.